When we hear from people who have experienced life in community, uh, we hear again and again that it has made them better and stronger and sturdier. It's made them more connected. Uh, they have discovered life uh, in community. They've discovered the Christian life and who God has called them to be as they've lived in community with other people. Uh, that's what's critical. That's what we've been talking about for the last few weeks. What does it look like to be in community? Why is it so important that we're in community? Uh, that's what we've been talking about. Today's the last day we're going to talk about that, well, in the sense of just solely focusing on that. Uh, and that's why today in your bulletin, uh, you see a list of different life groups that are going to be beginning after Labor Day. Some actually begin before Labor Day. Uh, what we want you to do, there's also a card in your bulletin. And that card simply says, yes, I'm interested in being a life group. Have someone contact me. You don't have to decide today what life group you want to be in. Uh, you just simply have to say, yes, I want to be in one, and I want somebody to help me discover which one I want to be in. And so uh, we hope that the takeaway from today's service, as we've listened and talked about this for the last few weeks, is that you say simply, hey, yes, this is something I want to be involved in. And if you leave us that card today, we're going to help you find the group. Uh, where you're going to fit in and where you're going to discover uh, some people that God has called you to live life with. And we think that's absolutely critical. Uh, today I want us to uh, look back again at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 is, um, once again, what we said last week, looking back at the original design. If we want to figure out what all this was supposed to be about, let's look back at how it was originally designed to be. And that's what we see here in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 20. It says, So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now, I had a good friend of ours who asked us to read this scripture at her wedding. And so I stood up to read this scripture at her wedding, and she remembered this scripture. This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And so we all kind of remember that part of the scripture. She didn't really remember how it ended, though. Uh, and so I want to read you the last verse that, uh, that caught her eye when I read it. For verse 25 says, The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. And when I read that last verse, her head popped up from looking at her husband. She was like... <laughs> And sometimes people stop before they read that last verse because we're talking about naked stuff in church, and that seems odd. <laughs> but that last verse is important. For the nakedness that they're talking about there is not simply physical nakedness. It's also emotional, spiritual, mental nakedness. It simply means they weren't hiding from one another. Adam and Eve in God's original design were simply allowing themselves to be seen for what they were. They didn't hide their emotions. They didn't hide their fears. They didn't hide their dreams from one another. They were naked before them. They just allowed themselves to be exactly who they were. And they saw each other for exactly who they were. And they simply, they let their guard down. And you and I have experienced those moments in life as well. We've had those moments when we let our guard down, when we just simply let people see us for who we really are. Those moments maybe when you shared a dream, kind of a crazy dream with somebody. Those moments when you shared a fear or a doubt that you were struggling with. And those moments where you simply risked being open with somebody else. We've had those kinds of moments when we were there in God's design for us, when we simply let ourselves be transparent before some other people. I... Uh, there's a show that came on television. I don't know if it's still on or not, but it was called The Naked Archaeologist. You ever see? And he kind of stripped everything down. It was about stripping it down so you saw it for just what it was. There's also a show on television called The Naked Chef. Uh, just kind of stripping it all down, just letting you see what it's really like, you know. And, and I sometimes think our church, I'll say Grace Community Church, The Naked Church. <laughs> and we can't do it because people will get the wrong idea. But it would be cool to say, in this place, we're all naked in a spiritual sense, right? That we're simply letting people see us for who we are. We're recovering what was lost. Uh, that, that sense of just letting people see us for who we really are. 
That was God's original design for community, for people, to, to allow them to simply be free in front of one another, to be seen for who they are. And yet something happened. Because for most of us, those moments when we get naked in front of people, when we, when we spiritually are sharing something that's going on in our life, when we're sharing something emotionally that we're struggling with, when we're sharing a doubt that we have or a fear that we have, those moments for most of us are unnerving and uncomfortable, aren't they? Most of us don't like that. We've lost something that existed here of God's original design. And now we begin to hide from one another. Now, it's not hard to figure out what happened. We said last week that in chapter 3, we, we see where everything gets messed up. And in chapter 3 of Genesis, beginning in verse 6, we read this. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. They disobey God. They do what God told them not to do. And what do they immediately begin to do? They begin to hide. They begin to clothe themselves. They begin to hide from one another, and they begin to hide from God. That's a consequence of sin, not God's original design. Now they've begun to hide from one another. Now they begin to, to put up barriers between one another. And now for hundreds upon hundreds of generations, we have perfected the art of hiding from people. And most of us have gotten really good at it. We know how to disguise our emotions and how to hide our fears and how to hide our dreams. We've learned not to share, not to reveal. We've learned well how to hide. Even in the church. Even in the church, we know how to hide, don't we? I mean, we get dressed for church, and we grab our church Bible, and we show up at church, and we've learned all the correct answers to all the questions that people ask us. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are the kids? They're great. Uh, how's the job? Moving up. We've learned all the right answers to the questions. It's kind of like the little boy in Sunday school, uh, and the Sunday school teacher was asking them questions, and the Sunday school teacher said to the kids, uh, what is uh, furry? Uh, has, a, has a long bushy tail, eats nuts and climbs in trees. And the little boy thought for a second. And he said, well, it sure sounds like a squirrel, but I'm sure the answer is Jesus. Isn't that the answer to every question in Sunday school? I mean, hey, I know it. It sounds like this, but I've learned how to give the right answers. And that's what most of us have done in life. We've learned how to give the right answers. We've learned how to present the right front. We've learned how to play act. We've learned how to hide from one another. We see that here as a consequence of Adam and Eve's disobedience, as a consequence of sin, but not as a part of God's original intention. Casting Crowns wrote a song that you guys who listen to Christian music will probably uh, know called The Stained Glass Masquerade. And in this song, they, they describe the church like this. Happy plastic people under shiny plastic steeples with walls around our weakness and smiles to hide our pain. Happy plastic people under shiny plastic steeples. Most of us know what they're talking about. Most of us have been there one time. Most of us have participated in creating plastic people under shiny plastic steeples. We know what it means to play act, to pretend, to wear a mask, to not let people see us for who we really are problem with this is that, that Jesus didn't have much tolerance for play acting. Uh, for Jesus came to enable us to be ourselves, to enable us to recover what was lost so long ago in the Garden of Eden. And Jesus' tolerance for play acting uh, was not high at all. Matthew chapter 23, beginning in verse 27, he says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Listen, most of us like 
uh, like Jesus to be nice and fluffy. We like fluffy Jesus. I mean, Jesus is nice. He always says nice things. But here Jesus says some pretty harsh words. You hypocrites, you whitewashed tombs, you pretend to be something, but on the inside you're something totally different. Jesus didn't have much tolerance for religious people who play acted, who pretended to be something that they weren't. And it's easy because we like to get to the Pharisees when we read the Scripture. God, that's right, Jesus, give it to them. Those old Pharisees, they deserve it. They're always acting, they acting like they were better than everybody else. They put on their old Sunday face and went to church, the synagogue, all that kind of stuff. Get on them, Jesus. Until we take a good hard look at ourselves. And many of us here say, he could be talking to me. He could be talking to me. The, the word for hypocrisy is, is, is play acting. Jesus says, you guys who are play acting, it's like you're in a play, pretending to be something that you're not. And you know what? It's no wonder when we talk to people about coming to church, we invite people to come and be a part of what God is doing here, that so many people say, I don't want to go to church because they're just a bunch of hypocrites. And you know, I've heard that so many times, and I'm ready for it when they say it. And my answer is, man, you're right. Our church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. That's what it is. Because that's how we learn to live. That's how many of us were brought up. You don't cry, son. Don't show your tears. Don't reveal. Don't tell people your weakness. They'll usually, most of us learn to live that way. And so when we come into the life of the church, that's the way we come to churches full of hypocrites, but they're right where they need to be because in a community of grace, in a community of grace is where people begin to find healing. In a community of grace is where people begin to learn to take off their mask. In a community of grace where people begin to be known by some other people and they begin to know others and their, their fears and their dreams and their sorrows. In that kind of community of grace, that's where we learn to take off our mask. Grace is not just a theological principle. Grace is the environment in which you and I were called to live, and it's the environment in which you and I were called to create. If fish were created to swim in the water, you and I were created to live in a community of grace. And grace is simply this wonderful knowledge that God loved me, before I cleaned up or straightened up, before all those kinds of things, God put his arm around me and said, Jeff, I love you. I didn't, I didn't have to do anything at all for God. God just loved me, and I didn't deserve it or earn it. God didn't look at me across this vast chasm of my sin and say, Jeff, hey, listen, when you clean up, when you straighten up, when you deal with all your issues, then come on over here, and, and I'll walk with you. God crossed that chasm himself, and God puts his arm around me and says, Jeff, listen, I love you. I love you now, not before you clean up, not before you, but right now, before all that, now I love you. And most of us here today have experienced that amazing grace of God, and it changed us. It wasn't the fear of hell that changed us. It was God putting his arm around us and saying, I love you now, just the way you are. I want you to be my child. And in that kind of community of grace, I was able to let go of my sin. I was able to let go of all those things that were holding on to me. I was able to just trust them all to God, saying, God, yes, you love me. You love me with this kind of great, awesome, grace-filled love. And now, God, in the midst of that, I begin to find healing in that community of grace. Once we've experienced that community of grace, you and I are called to help create that community of grace to create, help create places where people are loved just the way they are and accepted right where they are. We're called to create those kinds of communities where people can come in and know that they are loved and accepted for just who they are, right where they are on their own spiritual journey. Now, a lot of people are not accustomed to this kind of community of grace. Um, for most of us, that's not the way we were raised. I can't tell you how many conversations I have in my office with people through the years that begins with this word. Uh, Jeff, I want to share something with you, but I hope you don't think bad of me. That's how it begins. 
I hope you don't think bad of me, but... And then they begin to share. And when somebody begins the conversation with those words, I hope you don't think bad of me, I know that they're not accustomed to a community of grace. Because if they were accustomed to a community of grace, they would know that they could share with me whatever was going on, whatever they had done, whatever they'd been involved in. They know that they could share that with me, and I would still love them anyway. That I would still care for them. That nothing they can say, nothing they have done, would change the fact that I believe that they are beloved, precious, unique children of God. Nothing would change that. And you know what happened? The most awesome miracles happen when somebody comes into, into the office and they just, man, with their head down, they begin to share what's going on in their life and the things they've done, and, and they pour it out because we weren't meant to keep all that stuff in, and somehow, somewhere, it needs to come out, and people just begin to pour all that stuff out, and they lay it all down, they say all the awful stuff that's been existing in their life, and they put it all out there, and then they kind of look up with their head down to see what I'm going to do. And I do what all good preachers do. What in the world? <laughs> That's what we expect of people, right? But you know what happens when I, when I look at them and I say, you know what? I love you. I love you as much now as I did 15 minutes ago. Nothing you've said has changed my mind about who you are in Christ. Nothing. That's grace. And in that community of grace, we find healing. In that community of grace, we find the strength to take off our mask and to simply be who God has created us to be. Now, I'll be honest with you, not everyone likes a community of grace because communities of grace are messy because people stop pretending. They just simply allow you to see them for who they really are. We had a, uh, we had a, a young man speak at one of our small groups uh, one Sunday morning, I've shared this story with some of you, and, and uh, while he was speaking to this small group, he said a debatable curse word. You know those curse words that some parents let their kids say and other parents don't let their kids say? He said what I consider to be a debatable curse word. And, and I was walking the hall after the church. I came out, and this man came out of that small group meeting, and the, the veins in his neck were about to pop. He was sweating. I mean, he was angry, and he began to just let me have it in the hallway. I mean, he was just simply, what kind of church is this? This young man said, I can't believe I heard this on a Sunday morning. This is not what I come to church for. And, and he was having, people are going by the hallways. Y'all know how that happens sometimes in church, even in church? And, and I was like, I said, oh, let's calm down here. It's all good. Everybody, we're all fine. Everything's fine here at our church. <laughs> yeah, everything's good. Uh, and I said, calm down a little bit. And I said, listen, why don't you, why don't you go home? You're, you're disturbed. Uh, and, and I'll call you tomorrow. <laughs> well, he was. I felt for him. I was going to have a heart attack or something. And so I called him up the next day, and, and I said, listen, I know you're really angry about what happened yesterday. I just want to check on you and see how you're doing. And, man, he was still angry. I mean, he was really angry. He talked about the young man's parents, talked about what a, what a bad young man he must be, and, and I mean, just went on and on. And, and I finally said to him, I said, I don't think you're going to like our church. I, I said, because not only are people going to occasionally say that word you heard yesterday, but I said, people are also occasionally going to say beep, beep, and beep. <laughs> Except I didn't say beep. I gave him three examples of other words he would hear around our church if he stuck around very long. And he agreed that he didn't like our church very much. <laughs> That's okay. Not everybody likes a community of grace. Because a community of grace, people are real. And those churches will always be messy. Because people stop pretending. They stop hiding. They simply let you see them for who they are. People get real in a community of grace. That's what happens. But it's in that community of grace that we discover healing. James chapter 5, verse 16, says this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Now I want you guys to hear that. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The Bible says there is a connection between our willingness to share our stuff with other people and to be prayed for by other people and experiencing healing. Listen, and if you want healing, if you want to get over 
stuff that you're struggling with, if you don't experience victory in your life, the Bible says there's, there's a connection between just having a place, a community of people, a small group of people, a life group of people, we call it, where you can come before them and simply be real and say, here are the things I'm struggling with right now in my life. And having people pray for you in that, that's where we begin to experience healing. But listen, what happens if people believe that if they tell you what's going on in their life, if they tell you what their struggles are, if they tell you uh, what they've gotten themselves into, if they believe they're going to experience judgment and condemnation and harshness, they don't deal with their sin, they hide it. And that's what many of us have learned to do. We don't deal with sin, we hide it. We don't confront sin, we hide it. That's what we do. That's the way we've learned to live. Problem is, it's outside of God's design for us. It's why so many of us struggle. It's why so many of us struggle to, to make progress in our Christian life, why we stay stuck doing the same old stupid things over and over and over again. Because God created us for a community of grace. I'll tell you why I need that community so bad. It's not just for people who are messed up. It's for all of us. I need that because, uh, listen, there's a little voice in my head that whispers to me even today. You know, being a new preacher is fun. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, I was at my last church 15 years. I had messed up a bunch of times. I had people that didn't like me much at all. Uh, and so, I, and so it's, it's great to get to start over because all you guys have been so nice. And, and I mean, I, I try to be on my best behavior and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's great because many of you seem like you like me right now. And it feels great. <laughs> but there's a little voice in my head that whispers, just wait, Jeff, till you mess up. <laughs> wait till you mess up. Wait till you don't call somebody that you were supposed to call. Wait till you don't show up for an appointment that you were supposed to have. Wait till you say one of those debatable curse words during worship, you know. <laughs> Wait till you preach a really stinker sermon and people go, what was he drinking this week? <laughs> Wait till those moments. There's a little voice that whispers, you'll see. When they see you for who you really are, then you'll see what happens. Don't let them see. And so part of me says, well, I won't let them see. I won't let them see. I won't mess up. I'll call everybody back. I'll return every email. I'll show up for everything. I won't ever fail. I'll just put all my effort into performing for you guys so that you'll love me like a little circus monkey. I'll just keep doing it and doing it and make everybody happy. Except that's no fun. There's no joy in that. That's painful. That hurts. That's what so many of us are doing. We're just pretending because we're scared of what happens when people will see us for who we really are. It's in the community of grace that we're healed. It's a community of grace that God has called us to create here, where people can discover that they are loved no matter what. And those communities of grace are best discovered, not in, not in places like this where I do all the talking and you guys have to listen. But th that community is best discovered in small groups of people gathered together, living life together. Casting Crowns, at the close of their song, Stained Glass Masquerade, says this, But would it set me free if I dared to let you see the truth behind the person that you imagined me to be? Would your arms be open or would you walk away? Would the love of Jesus be enough to make you stay? Would your arms be open or would you walk away? And that's the question deep down so many of us are asking. It's the question that keeps us from dealing with our stuff because we don't believe there are people there who would be there for us when, when we just reveal who we really are. I can't create a community of grace by myself. You can't create a community of grace. But together, together we could create communities of grace where people experience healing and wholeness. And I believe that's what exactly what God has called us to do.